Hey guys, welcome back to Coldrome. In this video, we're going to start working on the authentication portion of our GraphQL chat application. Now, before we get into that, I'd like to recommend that you go back and watch one of the previous videos that I've uploaded. And this one is titled Authentication on the Web, Sessions, Cookies, JWT, and Local Storage. This one is a good introduction into the topic of authentication at large. And I do recommend you go back and watch that video first. Now, going back to today's episode, before we start working on the authentication part, I'd like to first address some of the questions that you guys raised in the comment section. So one of the questions was about the config.js file. And specifically, you guys were asking, should we actually take the secrets stored in this file and push them to our source code on GitHub? And the answer, of course, is not. Because if you have secret values stored in this file, you would want to make sure that they don't end up in your source code so that other people can actually read them and utilize them for their own purposes. So to go around this, one way would be to create a .n file. And if you want to learn more about .n files as well as environment variables in Node.js, I've actually created a video titled Configuring Environment Variables in Node.js. This one talks about the environment variables in a lot more detail. But for the time being, I'm going to create a .n file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy all the variables from config.js. Let me select all of them. And once we do, I'm going to go ahead and copy them to .n. And so in this file, we can actually go ahead and assign values to those variables. So for instance, for the port, we could assign 3000. The environment in this case would be development. We can also have our database username as well as other variables. So the purpose of this file becomes to actually supply the real secrets to our application. So instead of putting the actual password to your database inside of the config.js file, you would put it inside of the .n file. And you would also want to make sure to go to git ignore and also add the .n file inside of it. So this way the .n file will be ignored by git. This way you won't be able to accidentally commit it to your source code. So once you fill out all the variables in your .n file, what you could do to load them is you could install a .n library or package, or you could simply go to your package.json and you can go ahead and add an eval command. So we're gonna do eval on the .n file. And so what this is gonna do is it's going to read all of the values from the .n file and it's gonna pass them to the nodemon command. This way all of the variables stored in this environment file will be loaded to your application at runtime. Now the next question would be, do we actually need to provide the defaults in this case? And the answer is no, because assuming that you pass all of the variables from the .n file, the defaults in this case should not be necessary anymore. But it's a good practice to keep them as a fallback, so I'm gonna keep them in this case. And once again, if this eval syntax is confusing to you, make sure to go back and watch the environment variables video. Now the next question was about validation in our application. So if we go to schemas user.js, the error message for the password field is actually incomplete because in this case, aside from validating where special characters and letters and digits in our password, we also check for the length of the password. So in this case, the password has to be between 8 and 30 characters long. So one thing we could do is we could improve the error message itself. So we could mention that the length of the password has to be between 8 and 30 characters. But a much simpler solution would be to use the built-in minimum and maximum methods enjoy. So we could say that the minimum length has to be 8 and the maximum needs to be 30. Though in this case we could actually bump it up to 50 or even 100. Once again this depends on the business requirements of the application. I'm going to keep them at 50 for now, though of course most people probably wouldn't go beyond 15 or even 10 characters long. So let's leave it at 50. Now for the regex itself, we could either update it to 850, or what we can do is we can also remove the last portion of the regex. And we can even simplify it by removing the condition for special characters. I'm actually going to update the error message as well. So in this case, we're looking for at least one lowercase letter, one uppercase letter, and one digit. And before closing off the expression, I'm going to put period star. This is going to mean any character, any number of times, but of course it's going to apply other rules as well. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the index.js file and I'm going to change sign up from uppercase to lowercase because in this case the convention is the uppercase letter is reserved for constructor functions. And now to update it, we'll have to go back to resolvers. So let me update the mutation. So the sign up is going to be lowercase like this. So we can save it. And now we can actually work on the authentication portion itself. So let's go back to the browser. What I'm going to be using for authentication is the express session package. This package is once again used as a session middleware for express. Let's go back to the terminal. I'll do a yarn add dev on that package. And once again, if you're new to it, feel free to go back to my channel. The last video that I've uploaded before this one is titled Session Authentication Express, and it actually walks you through the different configuration options in this package, 
and it explains how to set it up in a lot more detail. But assuming you have a basic familiarity with this package, we're gonna go back to our project and we're gonna go ahead and go to the index.js file. We'll go ahead and import session from express session. So once we create an instance of express, we're gonna do an app use of session. We're gonna pass a configuration object. We're gonna pass a name. Once again, I'm going to extract it from a variable. Let's call it session name. We're gonna need to also add it to the config.js file. So let's do exactly that. We'll have a session name. We'll default to session ID. We'll also have session secret and also session lifetime set to two hours. So we'll have a thousand milliseconds multiplied by 60. This will give us 60 seconds, 60 minutes or one hour multiplied by two. This is gonna give us two hours. So we can save that. Now we can actually import these variables as well. So let's go ahead and add them in our import statement. So we already have a session name. We're also going to pass a secret set to session secret. We'll have a configuration for a cookie itself. But before that, let's also not forget to set we save to false because it's true by default. And we'll also set save uninitialized to false as well. Now for the cookie, the maximum age is going to be a session lifetime. Same site is going to be true. Secure is gonna be conditional depending on whether we are in production or not. So we're gonna set it to in prod like this. Now the last property I want to configure is actually store. Now you may or may not know that this library actually uses an in-memory store by default. And that means that every time you restart the server, it's going to clear out all the sessions saved in the session store. So to make it more persistent, what we can do is we can actually use one of the production ready stores. So for example, we could use the Redis one. In this case, we can go ahead and use the connect Redis library. So this one allows us to wire up the session middleware to the Redis store. And so what we need to do is we need to install this client so let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna go back to the terminal. Let's do a yarn add of connect Redis. So now to use it, we need to import it and also call it with the session middleware. So let's do that. Let's import connect Redis from connect Redis. We're gonna go ahead and create a Redis store. We're gonna call connect Redis with session. And once we do, we're gonna create an instance of a store. We're gonna new up Redis store like this and we'll pass in a few options in this case we're going to pass a host a port as well as password and of course all these options are also documented on the website so you could see we can pass a host we can also pass an existing client but in this case we'll limit it to a host a port as well as a password over here so what i'll do is i'll reference existing variables let's call them redis host redis port as well as redis password so let's go ahead and also add them to our config. Now, once again, I'm going to add defaults to these variables. So for example, this could be a local host. Typically the port will be 6379 and the password could be secret. Now, of course, these values will vary depending on the environment. So you would need to copy these values and also paste them to your .n file and make sure you initialize them with the actual secrets so you could connect to your Redis store. Now, in this case, what we can do is we can either install Redis locally. We could also set up a Docker container. Alternatively, we could also use Redis as a service. So for example, you could go to redislabs.com. Now here you can create a free account. And once you do, you can go ahead and create a database, of course, for free. If you go to the configuration section, you're going to find out the address to the server with the actual port, as well as the password that you can use. So I already have an existing database. So I'm going to use this one for the tutorial. And of course, once you have the credentials, make sure to put them to your .n file. Don't put them to the config.js file because the config is really just a fullback for your secrets. But once again, the actual secrets would go to the .n file. So once you do, we can go ahead and back in our index.js file, we can once again copy these variables and also put them over here. So once we set up a store, we can actually pass it to our session middleware. So this way it's going to use a Redis store and this way the sessions will not be lost even when the server restarts. So once this is done, we can go to our user resolvers. And so looking at the user's query, what we could do here is we could call a method. So for example, check signed in. We could also reuse the same method in other queries as well. But for the sign up mutation, it would make sense to call it check signed out, for example. So all of these helper functions, we can actually go ahead and extract them to a separate file. So let's create a file called auth.js. We can go ahead and create a constant. This will be a function to check if the user is signed in. Now, in this case, we have access to the context. And from that context, we need to get access to the request object. 
So if we could do context dot request, this is going to give us access to the session. And once we have access to the session, we can read any variables stored in that session. So for example, we could access the user ID that we're going to put in later on. So now to enable the access to the request object, we can go back to our index.js file and then we're going to pass in a property to our Apollo server to configure a context. This will be a function. It's going to accept a context object. What we can do is we can extract the request and response objects out of it and we can return them in a separate object like this. So once we do that, we should be able to go back to our user's query and now we'll have access to the request object in the context. So now once we have the request object, we can access the session on it. So one thing we could do is we could pass the session itself to the function. We could also pass the user ID if it's present, but I think it makes sense to pass the entire request to the function and let the function figure out whether the user is signed in based on that request object. So let's do exactly that. So back in our auth.js, this will be a function that accepts a request object and it's going to check if the request session contains a user ID. Now there's a few things we could do here. If the request does not contain a user ID on the session, we could actually go ahead and throw an exception. So let's do an if here. If we don't have a user ID, we're going to throw an exception. In this case, we can refer back to Apollo server package. We can go to error handling and let's look for authentication error. As you can see, it's one of the errors that we can reuse. So let's copy it. I'll paste it in over here and we're also going to have to import it. So let's do exactly that. Authentication error from Apollo server express like this. And we can also pass any custom error message. You must be signed in. Now this function, of course, we can export from this file. And so back in our resolvers, we could either import the function alone from auth one level up, or we could also import everything from that file because we're also going to have other functions like check signed out, for example. This will be another function as well. So to import all of them, what we can do is we can import everything from that file as auth, for example. So this way we can do auth dot check signed in. We'll do the same thing over here. And now in there, we're going to do auth check signed out. Once again, we're going to extract request from the context and we're going to do the same thing over here as well. So now that we've done that, let's go back to this file. So here we're going to do the reverse of this operation. So if the user is actually logged in, we're going to say that you are already signed in like this. And of course, we're going to do an export of that function. Now, this condition in the if is actually repeated. So we can extract it into a separate function. We can call it signed in. Once again, it takes a request and returns request session user ID. So in this case, we can call that helper function signed in with the request object. Once again, if we're not signed in, in this case, we're going to throw an error saying that you have to sign in in order to perform this action. But in check signed out, we're going to call signed in like this. And if the user is signed in, we're going to throw an error saying that you are already signed in. Let's also add another query. We're going to call it me. Well, this will be a function that will tell you what user you're signed in as. So in this case, we're going to have to do an auth check signed in before anything. We're also going to need to work on projection as well. And once that's done, we can do return. Of course, we also need to have all the parameters. And so root, args, context, and info. We'll grab request from context. And we're going to return a user find by ID. And we should expect to have a request session user ID in there. And of course, if we don't, this section over here should fail because it's going to call a check signed in function. This one fails when you're not signed in. And if you are signed in, we're going to find the user by user ID stored in this session, and we're going to return that user back to the client. Now we already have the sign up mutation. It might also help to work on the sign in mutation as well. So let's do a sign in function. Once again, we'll have a root args context and info. Let's get the user ID from request session. Once again, we'll extract session from context like this. Next, we could put the check signed out condition. So in this case, if the user is already signed in, it doesn't make sense to call that mutation once again. In fact, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to put a condition. So if the user is signed in, we're going to simply return back that user. So we'll do a user find by ID and we already have the user ID. So instead of throwing an error, we're just going to return back the user. And this is similar to the sign up mutation where we create the user and return it back to the client once it's created. So in fact, by the end of this sign in mutation, we're also going to return back a user. So on the same note, let's go back to our type definitions. I'm going to add another mutation. Let's call it 
sign in. We're going to ask for an email as well as password and we'll return back a user. Once again, I'm not going to put an exclamation point because this operation might fail. And if it does, we're going to get back an error and not the actual user object. And since we're in the same file, I'm also going to add another mutation. Let's call it sign out. And this one will not take any parameters. We're just going to return back a boolean to indicate whether the sign out was successful or not. So now let's save this file. And back in here, we're going to add another function. Let's call it sign out. We'll have root args context and info. Let's get the request object from there. Now, once we establish that the user is not logged in, we're going to have to go ahead and validate the argument passed to the query. So let's call joy.validate. We'll pass the args. We're also going to have to pass in this schema, which we're going to have to create. Now, if you remember, we already have a schema to sign up a user. In this case, we're going to add another schema. Now, because in this case, we're validating for multiple fields, including email, username, name, and password, this will not work if we want to only validate the email and the password fields. Once again, for the sign-in, mutation, we only have the email and password. So if we try to use the same object to validate that payload, it's always going to fail because we're going to miss the name as well as username fields. So in this case, we could do a named export of sign up. And now what do we want to do? Well, we want to call joy.object and ideally we want to specify the list of keys that we want to pass. For the sign up mutation, we want to pass the email, username, name and password, right? So this could be a separate object. But if we wanted to create a constant for sign in, in this case, we're going to call joy object. We will also have a set of keys. But in this case, the set will be different because we only want to validate the email and the password. So in fact, let me bring them on one line. So what we can do is we can create separate constants for every field. So let's do an email. I'm going to do a username. We'll have name and we'll also have a password like this. And now this old export default we can remove. So we're going to have two named exports for these sign up and sign in mutations. And now back in the index file, we're going to export everything from user like this. So now once we do, let's go back to this file. We're going to pull in sign up as well as sign in. Once again, these are going to match the two named exports in this file, sign up and sign in. So let's pull both of them in. We're going to pass in this sign in schema. And we also want to make sure that we don't abort early. So I'm going to pass abort early set to false, just like we did in the sign up mutation before. So I'm going to have to call a wait on it because this is an asynchronous operation. So I'll add async to the function. So once the validation is done, we're going to try to do a user find. So let's do user find one. And we're going to pass in an object with a condition for the email address. In this case, we're targeting args.email. So let's actually extract them from the arguments object. Let's have an email and password from args. So we can go ahead and pass the email in there. And of course, we're going to do an await on it because it's asynchronous. So if we don't find the user, we could throw an error. But because this logic is similar to what we have in the auth.js file, let's go ahead and create a helper function. So we're going to call it attempt sign in. We're going to accept the email and the password of the user in question. So this will be a function. Let's go ahead and remove this logic from here. So now once we export it, we can go ahead and call auth dot attempt sign in with the email and password. In this case, I'll just reference them directly. And now we're going to expect to get a user object by the end of this operation. 